everybody. Um, I am going to teach you assembly. Now, assembly is fairly low level, so we have uh, languages like Java, uh, which is a fairly high level object oriented programming language, and then you have slightly more low level stuff uh, like C, C, that kind of thing. And then you get all the way down to assembly, which is about as low as it gets without kind of getting super esoteric into machine code and stuff like that. Because, I mean, really all assembly is is translated machine code. It's understandable machine code, because uh, every command that you use in assembly to uh, store values to registers and all that stuff which we'll talk about uh, is basically English for an instruction that gets passed through the CPU. So it's really just about as close to dealing with bare bones hardware machine code stuff as you can get without actually really being there. Um, now, why would we ever want to learn assembly, you might ask? Um, well, there's, to be honest, not a whole lot of reasons. Um, one big reason, which is kind of going to be the purpose of the series I'm going to make, um, is to create an operating system, uh, which requires you to deal with... Um, well, the assembly part is going to be um, writing your boot sector, uh, which is a 512-byte piece of code written in assembly that basically prepares the computer uh, for or to run a kernel, uh, which is your main operating system, like Windows or or w what you think of like as Windows or, in my case, Arch Linux. Um, so. It, you have to use, and with boot sectors, you know, you're fairly restricted. Uh, it's very specific and precise. It's not all assembly is quite like a boot sector, where, um, but, uh, you know, it's, it, that's a common application for it. Uh, also, writing like AES encryption stuff, which I'm not going to get into because I'm not a genius when it comes to that sort of thing. Um, oftentimes, we'll use assembly. Uh, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, and uh, if you're just into it, you want to learn more about, you know, how your computer works, that kind of thing, uh, assembly will be a good tool for you to know, albeit you can get by just fine with C and C++. Um, or even Java, although Java, it's not, you have to have a third-party software to run Java, which is kind of a downside. Um, that third-party software is compatible with many things, but um, especially with Linux users, you know, if you're running Arch, you don't have Java unless you say you want it. Same with Windows, same with Mac. So right now, I don't have a Java SDK or JDK on this machine because I haven't used it and I don't need it, uh, which is going to be a problem if you're writing Java applications. C++, however, um, uh, you can easily install GCC pack or G++ GCC packages um, uh, in Linux, and oftentimes it'll that uh, that that's kind of mandatory for to run most applications. So, um, you know, C++ is much more nice and uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Native. <laughs> um, anyhow, the first thing that you're going to need to do if you want to learn assembly and follow along with me in these tutorials is install a few things. Now, just open up a terminal here. The first thing you're going to need to install is a G++ library. So, um, to do that, now I'm running Arch, so uh, for no matter what distro of Linux you're using, this is for Linux, by the way, no matter what distro of Linux you're using, you're going to need to run this, you're going to need to run as a super user or an elevated user. So you're going to need sudo. Um, now in Arch, we have Pacman, uh, which I'm assuming stands for Package Manager. Um, dash s and then g plus plus. Now, oh fuck. Oh, it's GCC. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, I I've had this installed a long time. It's GCC. Um, now I already have it installed. Um so I'm not going to continue with the installation, but you need to install GCC for if you're using like a, a Ubuntu or I believe Mint also uses the same thing. I'm not sure about Mint, but I know Ubuntu uses this. Uh, you're going to need to run sudo um, apt get uh, install 
GCC. Um, um, but that I am not doing that, so I am not going to be. I'm going to be using Pac-Man. Um, the next thing that I'm going to be using is NASM. I know there's AT&T, which is natively supported um, by Linux. You can, I believe, you can use a gas assembly, which is AS something or other, um, to compile your AT&T syntax uh, assembly code. But we're using NASM because NASM, well, let's be honest, is much better documented. Uh, there, you can find tutorials. Any tutorial you're going to search for for Linux is most likely going to be using the NASM syntax, which is the Intel syntax. So that's what we're going to be using. It's not native, but um, it's just a single package, so it's not a big deal. Uh, to install that, you're just sudo uh, pacman uh, nasm, and I've already got it, so I'm not going to. Uh, then the last thing you can use, uh, the last thing you're going to need is um, a text editor of some sort. Uh, now, Nano does exist. Oh god, how do I get out of here? But uh, I don't use Nano, as you can probably tell. Um, I use Vim, um, which in my opinion is just much easier to work with. Uh, so if you want to use Vim, which is what I'm going to be using, and you don't already have it, you're going to need a sudo pacman vim. And once again, I already have it, so... <laughs> okay, so those are all the installation things you're ne going to need to run through. Uh, to get you set up. Oh, and then one more thing. Since we're doing this uh, for an operating system, uh, as a boot sector, we are going to need to. We're going to need some way of testing our code. Now we could use, for just general assembly applications, we could build a, like a C++ front end. Um, but that's not what we're looking for. We're looking to interact with BIOS and stuff like that as a boot sector. So we're going to need an, an, a processor, a CPU emulator, basically. Now there's a couple emulators you can use. You can use, I believe, uh, is a box B O C H S something like that. Box Boches, Boches. I don't know. Um, or you can use Kimu, which is what I'm using. Um, so to install Kimu, um, you probably guessed it. You're just gonna need sudo pacman s Kimu. I already have it, so I'm not gonna reinstall it. Um, and then that will give you Kimu. Now Kimu may take a little while to install, and G++ may also take a little while. I'm sorry, GCC may also take a little while to install. Um, so now that we've got Kimu, we've got NASM, we've got Vim, and we have GCC, it is time to start. So uh, let me navigate to... Uh, oh, and I, I happen to like the... Windows style of sorting files for users, so I've kind of adopted the same thing. Uh, CD. So the with with okay. So the first thing what we're going to do is we're just going to talk about assembly, just the basics. So let us create a a new assembly program. Now to do that, you're going to. Uh, use vim to create the file, so it's going to be vim and then whatever you want. We're, we'll just call it, um, um, ooh, what shall we call it? We'll just call it main. Dot asm. Uh, now that really could be uh, anything you want it to be, but asm tends to be the standard file um, extension. Alright, so now that we have done that, we are in our Vim environment, or if you're using Nano, you're going to be in your Nano environment. Uh, and we can start writing. So, the first thing we need to talk about before we start is about registers, because if you've ever done anything like C++ or Java, uh, then you'll know, well, I would hope, you would know or be very familiar with variables. Um, you know, functions or what they call, they're called methods, uh, scoping, that kind of stuff. In assembly, uh, because we're dealing almost direct, pr directly with the CPU, um, we don't have those things. Uh, not really. We have, what we do is we interact with CPU registers. Um, 
Now, there are various different CPU registers out there um, on, on, on CPUs, and it depends on if you have an x86 architecture or if you have an x86-64 architecture. Or, well, a 32-bit architecture or a 64-bit architecture, that's what I mean. Um, so, uh, let's see, uh, CPU registers. Registers. Um, uh, let's see, is it on a OS dev? Yeah, okay. So, now, there are different there's many different registers and they all have different in, uh, like uh, intrinsic purposes um, so you can that there are the, the there are general purpose registers um, which are at the largest 32 bit so let me explain this table here AL, AH, AX, and EAX, no, not EAX, AL, AH, and AX are all subparts of the 32-bit register EAX. So if I were to try to describe it visually, AL is the lowest 8 bits of the 32-bit register EAX. So if you have a hexadecimal value, say, 0xff0a or something like that, and you um, write that to EAX, then your AL register and your AH register will be the ones that are being used. If you try, if you uh, if you um, look at your AX register, you will see zeros. Uh, if you write, so if you have a two, if you have a hexadecimal zero X, uh, for example, this will become important later. Zero E or 0x10 uh, that will be the 0x0e we'll just go with that because that will be pertinent to your AH register actually but regardless it's an 8-bit uh, hexadecimal that will show up provided you do not store it to AH if you store it to EAX generally that will show up in your AL register if that makes any sense like that's that's how it maps so um, it goes, so AL and AH are your low, 8 low bits and 8 high bits of your 16-bit AX register. And then 16, that AX register is the low 16 bits of the 32-bit EAX register. And that follows suit with EBX, ECX, and EDX. Um, so thanks to this description we can see that the EAX register is an accumulator register, EBX is a base register, ECX is a counter register, and EDX is a data register. Don't get too caught up in that. That will become important later on, but for now just see these as generic registers. Then you have segment registers, which we're not going to get into too much, but just know that they are 16-bit uh, registers like uh, you know AX, BX, CX, or DX. Um, then you have index registers. Those will become important later on. Um, they're 32-bit and 16-bit. So these, the uh, SI is this lower 16-bit of ESI. The same thing with up here. So all of these registers are organized the same way. Um, then you have pointer registers. Uh, it's best not to mess with these because if you do, then you could well, you could cause some issues. <laughs> you could brick your system, um, especially if you move your your stack pointer, uh, and then it runs out of stack space effectively, um, either too high or too low. Then you could be in some pr trouble. So you should only deal with these if you really know what you're doing. Um, and then these are flags. So flags are going to be things that you're looking for. Um, when you execute certain instructions, and we'll talk about those later. Um, uh, they're a little bit, little bit awkward the first time, but they will start making more sense as we continue. Um, but right now they're not pertinent, so we will gloss over those and talk about them in more depth later. Uh, control registers, same thing. Um, the thing with control registers are they will become important when you start getting into or start transitioning in your boot sector from uh, the 16-bit real mode, which we'll talk about, 
to either 32-bit or 64-bit protected mode uh, when you're loading uh, global descriptor tables and you are um, transitioning over to protected modes uh, those control registers, especially control 3 and control 4, will become fairly important and we will talk about those later and then um, yeah, these are just more that we're not going to worry about for now. But the biggest thing that we're going to be talking about now are these general purpose registers. Um, so what exactly do registers do? Registers store data, basically. Well, not necessarily data. They store numbers. That's what they do. Um, so you can kind of treat them as variables. Kind of. They're not the same, but they kind of are. Um, Whereas when variables, you store a value to a certain location in memory, a register, that value is stored directly on the CPU. So that's what registers are. Now, to assign values to registers, uh, there are a f two, well, there's one command uh, that you're going to need to know, and that's the MOV command. Now, for AT&T syntax, for Intel syntax, you're going to have M oh good lord uh you're going to have mov um destination um uh destination and source and the reason why i'm using uh doing that is because uh when we get into pointers um, here, I'll just do slash value. Uh, that will become the, s that's the value and source will be two slightly different. That will be easier to think of it as a source than it will be as a value. And then destination is simply the register on which you want to store uh, the information from that source or that value. So, for example, if we wanted to put the uh, value, say, like, 13 or something on register EAX. We can say EAX 13. Um, now for AT&T syntax, it's a little bit more complicated. You have to think about what you're moving. So since EAX is a 32-bit register, let's see, 32-bit, that's long, I believe. Um, so you're going to need move L EAX, or I'm sorry, and then uh, it, it actually makes a little bit more sense AT&T does, um, because it's backwards. It's move uh, value to destination, that's how you could read it, whereas NASM is move um, to destination the value. Uh, so in this case, it's going to be move um, 13 EAX. Now, I'm not gonna. I don't know AT&T that well, so I'm gonna be focusing mainly on NASM. But for those of you who want just to know a little bit of background or a little bit more about AT&T, the dollar sign uh, indicates a uh, immediate, which would be like a, a number or something like that. So 13 would be an immediate, and a percent sign indicates a register. So um, move L 13 to EAX well, uh, does the exact same thing as move EAX 13. Um, but uh, we're not going to be talking about AT&T that much. I just wanted to give you a little bit of a taste about the other syntax. Now, uh, the another, another command you're going to want to know is the add command. So what add does is it will add a value to the value already existing in that register. So you can say add EAX 10 and if you try print or if you look at the value of EAX it should be 23. Okay so we've done that register. Okay stack that's right. Alright so the stack is kind of like reserved registers because as you've noticed there's not a whole lot of registers to deal with. Um, you have what you have your four general purpose registers and you have your destination or your index registers and those are basically the ones you've got to deal with so 
in those four general purpose registers, granted, you do have four separate registers you can write to, or sub-registers you can write to being A, or, um, you, you know, um, and for, for the EAX register, you do have AL, AH, AX, and then EAX. Um, but, and whereas e, where, where EAX, you cannot access the higher 16 bits. But, um, if you think about it, that's really not a whole lot of space. Uh, that's not a whole lot of, so, uh, yeah, it's just not it's not a lot of space to work with. It's not a lot of memory, or it's not a lot of uh, effective variables that you can use. So we have what's called a stack, and what a stack does is it effectively stores registers for later use. So let's say I've got EAX is already being used as something like it's already, it already has a value, and I need to. I need to access the AX register or something, uh, and that already has data information in it. I can push uh, EAX to this, or I can push AX to the stack, and then while AX is pushed to the stack, I can that effect. What that does is that effectively um, localizes the AX I'm about to work with now. If that makes any sense and isolates the AX that is more global. So now I can say like move um, AX um, 0X um, A5 or A4 or something. Uh, whoopsies, comma. Uh, 0X4 and do something with it. And then uh, I can pop AX. So I can use this AX while that is pushed uh, for something completely different than this AX would be used for. And then when I'm done with that, I can pop this AX back into uh, back into play, and uh, it will be unaffected by everything that's happened since I pushed it. If that so, that's what the stack is used for. Um, now, when you're dealing with a stack, um, the it, this well, the stack sounds exactly like what it is. It stacks the stacks stuff. So if I like, push um, bx, and then I do stuff, and then I push say ax, and I uh, do more stuff. I have to pop AX before I can pop BX. Um, because that was the last thing that was put on the stack. Uh, and then I can pop BX. So that's just kind of how the stack works. So when you're putting things on your stack, just keep mi that in mind. Usually it doesn't, it's not a big deal, but sometimes it can be. So just keep that in mind. All right, let's see. Uh, stack, move, add. Okay, system calls is the last thing we're going to talk about. Um, a system call, or a BIOS interrupt, in this case, um, is a function that BIOS can execute to do things. So, in our application here, we'll be using uh, the interrupt z uh, 0x0e. Wow, I suck at typing today. Um, which is, and the interrupt um, 0x10. The first one, 0x0e, is a um, basically tells it, it moves the cursor basically in BIOS. So, for example, that green block, say that's my cursor, when I print F. Um, that 0x0e interrupt in BIOS is what causes that green spot to move past F. If that wasn't there, it would still be on F, so the next thing I print, um, well, uh, would overwrite F. Um, so I can only print one character, that, even though I would be printing multiple characters, it would just be writing over each other, so that 0x0e causes the cursor to move forward. Now, 0x10 
is the BIOS interrupt that basically prints stuff to the screen. So, uh, and we'll we'll look at how that's done um, right now. So, to print things to the screen in BIOS or in in assembly. Um, well, first we should talk about boot sectors because that's what we're going to be using here. That's what we're effectively we're going to be using. We're going to be creating a boot sector to do this. Um, so, a boot sector cannot be anything more than 512 bytes. So, to do that, we're going to pad everything we don't write of that 512 bytes with zeros because it has to be exactly 512 bytes. So, let's say we uh, do stuff up here. Uh, then, to pad it, we're going to use times uh, 510. The reason we're using 510, you'll see in just a second. Um, minus, so but if we just did times 510 um, db0, then that would um, pad with exactly 510 zeros regardless of how much stuff we actually have in there. So it could be 500, it could, if we have nothing, it would be exactly 512 bytes. If we had stuff, it would be over 512 bytes. So that's not what we want. What we want is we want to uh, pad 510 zeros minus dollar sign minus dollar sign db0. Now what that means, the dollar sign, this dollar sign is our current location in memory or our current location in the boot sector. This dollar, double dollar sign is the start location in the boot sector. So what we're saying is we're saying, or yeah, it's the start location. So what we're saying is we want 510 minus the segment of code, or the segment that we have written. Because our current location minus the start location is the total, uh, yeah, well, it's, it's the total uh, n amount of stuff that we've written, the total amount of code that we've written, the total number of um, instructions that we have written. Uh, so that's what we want to fill with zeros, and that will give us exactly 510 bytes inclusive. To get that extra two bytes, what a boot sector needs at the end is what's called the magic number. So we'll call this uh, padding and magic number. Okay, oh, and the semicolon is a comment, by the way. Um, what the magic number is, is the magic number, it's like the, the keyword that tells the computer that it is a boot sector um, and not just random data written on a floppy disk or a hard drive or anything. So what that magic number does is it allows, well it tells the computer please run this as a boot sector um, and that is what you know runs all of you, that, that is what runs all of your code and then eventually loads into the kernel. So in order to cr the, uh, create the magic, the magic number is at the end. So uh, the magic number is the same for all machines, it's zero X A A five five, um, and those are the last two bytes. Is it zero A A five five? I believe it is. That will pad everything out and tell us it's a boot sector. Then that will allow us to do stuff. So right now, what we're gonna do. Um, Oh, whoopsies. Is we are going to print a character to the screen that lets us know that we have successfully loaded our boot sector. So to do that, what we can do is this. Move 2AH0X0E, which if you recall is the command, BIOS command, that uh, moves your cursor forward. Um, allows the lateral printing of characters. And then we need to move into AL our character. So let's move in that character. Or X. 
I, I like X better. All right, and then we'll call or we'll use the BIOS interrupt uh, to print it to the screen. Okay, and then we will um, run a infinite loop that jumps to our current location. Um, and that will just cause us to hang there. Okay, so now to compile this, we have, we'll use NASM, uh, F B I N, um, what is that, main dot ASM, and if you want to specify an output, dash O main dot B I N. So now if we look in there, we have a main.bin. Um, now if we look at main.bin, we'll see that it kind of looks weird. Um, and that is machine code for you. Um, to look at that as, or well, it's binary data is what it is. To look at that as raw machine code in Vim, um, you uh, in semicolon to, for command uh, you will type in percent exclamation xxd uh, notice at the bottom here percent exclamation xxd and then that will translate this to machine code and you see we have our 55aa um, which is weird it's written backwards but that's correct that's our magic number and then these are the CPU instructions um, that result in, or that that result from our assembly code of moving zero x zero e, which you can see here, to a h, moving. Um, the character X to AL and then executing the BIOS command 0x10 uh, and you can see X over here um, so uh, I'm going to quit overwrite because I don't want that to be machine code I want it to be binary data um, and now to execute that we'll use Kimu um, system uh, x86 64 main dot bin booting from hard disk and you can see we have our X written right there uh, whoopsies and our cursor has moved forward so that is the first thing we've we've have uh, just written a boot sector where if you were to run this on a floppy disk um, on actual hardware it would boot up and it would simply print X on the screen and that would be it and that seems fairly pointless right now but um, this is the first step we have um, written something that our computer recognizes as a boot sector and we have executed the code successfully and done exactly what we wanted to do, which was print an X, and that's pretty big. So next, we'll be talk uh, I will go over how to write an assembly function to print out a whole string. So stay tuned for that, and I will see you next time.